Christian tent, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Jesus, who can do the un unimaginable? The name of Jesus, no name that no the name that no one has ever had. What a beautiful name, what a powerful name. Let us all stand. Let us all stand.
Slaves has been in my Spotify playlist for nearly three years now. Every single time I listen to it, I feel a sense of relief and peace. The lyrics read, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. It reminds me dearly that my Lord and God is here with me. Therefore, I do not need to fear. These lyrics are repeated every single time. But I hear it. God comes to me, and I cannot help to sing along. So please sing along with me. Thank you.
time of difficulties, when we focus on all the things that are happening around us, we might be scared and even have doubts like Peter had with Jesus in the ocean. But we have to remember that God is right there with us through all the storms and all our difficulties in our life. And he will hold our hand throughout our life just like he did with Peter. So let's now sing Oceans.
morning. Beautiful, beautiful worship and praise music. I, I want to um, get the scripture that we're using today. If someone can help me by handing me some. Okay, some. Some. You got a helper behind you there too, okay? We are in Mark chapter 4, a very familiar parable that Jesus spoke. And um, I'm sure you've heard it many times before. Uh, we have on the wall, bearing much fruit for the Lord. Uh, the portion of scripture we have before us today has to do with fruit bearing. Has to do with the parable of the sower. And the title for my message this morning is Teaching by Illustration. And that's what a parable is. Parable. It's a, it's a story, an illustration that goes along with the lesson. So uh, you got a little definition there to start you off. But let's begin our time together with a word of prayer. Are there any special requests this morning for our prayer time? My neighbor man is not doing well. Um, his name is Joseph. Keep him in your prayers. This came upon him rather suddenly. And he's been in the hospital now three times for this. And um, let's keep, keep him in prayer. Any other special request? Father, we come before you this morning and our hearts are full. They are full because of life itself. They are full because of your wondrous love that sought us and found us, that was willing to pour out the very life of God that we might find life in Jesus Christ our Lord. How can we ever thank you enough? But our hearts also become full with life itself and the things around us that can impose themselves upon us, can burden our hearts, and cause us sometimes to be heavy with care. And yet your word says we are to cast all our care upon him. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The, the original actually says it matters to him about you. Father, thank you that we matter to you. And as you look down from your throne above, with all of the concerns going on in the world, there's nothing more important to the heart of God than the well-being of those creatures that he has made in his image and likeness. We thank you that your eye is upon us this morning, and we thank you for the focus that you have on our care on our lives themselves, but particularly on our life that we might dwell with you forever. We pray, Father, for the special request for prayer. We know that in the world there is a tremendous amount of concern and political upheavals and so forth, but many of those are very far away from us, and although we are troubled by the news, it doesn't often affect us directly. But when it has to do with a relative, a friend, or a neighbor, when it has to do with something in our own community, we, we, feel the, we feel the burden upon our own hearts. And so, Lord, we lift up Joseph to you today and ask that you'll undertake for his need. And also our brother Tim, who is still struggling as he recovers from the ailment that has caused him to be away from us for so long. Father, bless our homes, bless our families, bless our marriages, bless each individual that is gathered together here today and those that are not with us, be with them where we, they are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading from the first verse. 
As I said to you, this is a very familiar teaching of Jesus. It says, and he began again to teach beside the sea, that would be the Sea of Galilee, and a large crowd gathered to him or gathered around him so that entering into a boat, he sat in the sea, of course in the boat, and all the crowd were on the land by the sea. And I've mentioned this before, how water will carry a person's voice and sound. Uh, I've, I've even illustrated with maybe being at the lake and you hear a couple out fishing in the evening as things are becoming quiet and you can, you can literally hear every word they say as the water carries their voice. Well, without a public address system, without a loudspeaker and megaphone and some of the conveniences that we have today, Jesus uses this natural phenomenon to carry his voice so that the crowds that are seated on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, which are somewhat elevated. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the reasons why the winds that come over the Sea of Galilee cause such havoc is it's like blowing over the top of a straw, and the Sea of Galilee is quite shallow, and so there's quite an interesting effect. Uh, Jesus uses this all to his advantage as he addresses the crowd. And he taught them many things by parables, stories that go along with the lesson. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went up to sow. A sower is an individual that plants seed. And I remember as a boy on the farm, and I, I don't know, you might get a little weary of my farm stories, but we had a creek. A, a drainage creek that went through our farm and it wound its way through our property uh, which caused many of our fields uh, whether we're talking about wheat or otherwise uh, very difficult to plant there would be corners where the equipment would not would not go would not do an accurate job of of distributing the seed and my dad would give me a seed apron and it was it was just an apron but it had pockets in it and in those pockets uh, regardless of what it was uh, that I was planting uh, I had those particular seeds in there and I I had to be very careful to make sure that what I maybe had been planting the day before or we called it broadcasting I met, I had to make sure that if I was casting wheat seed out onto the soil uh, that I wasn't getting something perhaps from the day before like rye. And I remember other areas of the farm, my, my dad would have to go out with a, a hand corn planter and you, you struck it into the ground and dropped a seed in, covered it with your foot and uh, five inches from that you did the same thing and you worked as carefully as you could to get the rows straight, um, you were sowing the seed. And so a sower went forth to sow, and it was during the sowing that, and it's interesting that in the original it says, one landed, uh, so this is uh, having to do with one seed, and apparently this guy was very good with, his sowing of the seed. We're going to find from our story that the seed is very precious. And yet, an occasional seed would go, as it's being cast, would go astray and ended up on the walkway. Uh, it landed along the pathway where people would walk. Of course, that soil would be tamped down. It would be having been walked upon uh, very, it would be difficult for the seed to be able to penetrate the soil and it would lay on the top of the soil and uh, the birds of the air came and ate it. Uh, I don't need to tell you this morning that that was not the purpose of the seed. Uh, this 
sower, this farmer, as he's out planting, uh, was not casting seed for the purpose of feeding the birds. And yet I know on the farm there would be times even when the seed was properly sown, birds would come along and peck at the ground and uh, they'd find themselves a little treat. In fact, some of our seeds were coated with a substance that would discourage them from doing that. But obviously the purpose of sowing the seed is with a view to a crop in a future day. Uh, we learn from the scripture many things having to do with the seed, having to do with the planting of the sowing of seeds. And in fact, uh, one of the things that is used in a parable is that you don't sow, you don't plant and reap on the same day. There's time that has to pass by and you wait patiently for the earth to bring about the growth of the crop until the time of harvest. We'll, we'll get into that. Another landed on stony ground where it had insufficient soil. Now you can visualize this, you can imagine this. And it sprouted quickly. But having no depth of earth, having no depth of soil, when the sun came up, it was scorched. And it dried up because it had no root. I, this is just a point of interest. My, my yard right now, and if you take a drive in neighborhoods, you'll see lawns, uh, and the intent and purpose of a lawn is lush, green grass, and because it's been quite dry until last night, uh, we've seen an awful lot of lawns that are they're just yellow and maybe even brown. And, and it is fascinating that when the rain comes, uh, they percolate back up and grow again. Well, a well-established lawn may have as much as 16 inches of root. And that's why it doesn't die out. Well, the opposite is true here. A seed lands amongst the stones. It sprouts. The seed is good, we're going to find out. The seed has life within itself. The intention is that it would sprout and grow. Here is seed that does what is expected. However, the soil into which it falls does not accommodate because of the stones. And another landed amongst, I'm just going to say weeds, amongst thorn bushes. Ah, those are about the most undesirable we would go out into the fields and pull weeds sometimes because out by the road it not only didn't look good, but uh, just because of certain conditions alongside of the road, uh, it wasn't real accommodating for uh, whatever was planted there. And we didn't want the plant, the corn or whatever it might be, to have to compete with weeds. I don't mind pulling weeds, but I don't like pulling thorns and thistles. and. That's what we have here, is seed that landed amongst thorn bushes. And the thorn bushes grew. They, they, will, they will starve the ground of nutrition. They will start, starve the ground of, of moisture. And crazy enough, well, maybe it's not so crazy. I mean, it, it's almost expected that the weeds will overcome will take over that which you have planted, and there you are with your crop being choked out, and notice, producing no fruit. We're not told what this particular seed is, but regardless, the purpose of planting a seed is that a crop might later be harvested, that that seed would bear forth fruit and others fell into the good ground and produced fruit or a crop growing and increasing multiplying one bore one multiplied 30 times as much you start up with one seed you get 30 back uh, 160. Oh my goodness, there must have been a little extra fertilizer there. And 
Here's a seed that was planted that produced a hundredfold. And he said unto those that were there, if you have ears to hear, listen up. Focus on what's being said. Now, I did a little playing around. Um, I, I probably could use some help up here. Uh, in, in just a moment, I'll call on a couple of you guys. I, I have some, I have some ears. <laughs> Not these, but this. Ears of corn. And uh, you'll see here, this one has seeds growing from each end. It's not a very long ear. I've been out in fields where an ear of corn might be that long. And uh, I went out into a farmer's field uh, a year ago, and it maybe wasn't the best season for growing corn. But nevertheless, this is a full ear of corn. Uh, so is this one. And by the way, if, if you think this is kind of fancy, uh, this, is, this is popcorn from Indiana, okay? And that's why the seeds are so small. But if you were to count, and I'm not asking you to do that, but if you were to count and mark these off, there's way over 100 seed on this ear of corn. And by the way, that came from one seed. One seed. Uh, here, guys, take these and just pass them around. Now, what I have here, and, and, and please don't open these. These are kind of special, but you can pinch them, and you will feel that on this ear of corn, there's a couple of seeds there, okay? Uh, two or three. And, and by the way, I'm going to guess that if you were to take this apart and take those seeds, the, the two or three seed that are on this ear of corn are in they're not fully developed. And I doubt that they would grow. If they did grow, they wouldn't grow well. Uh, this one here, is, this is almost a joke. It's so sad. Be careful with it because quite frankly, what should be seeds in it are just little crumbs. Girls, I'll give these to you. And just uh, make sure that everybody gets the seed done, okay? Now, I'm going to say it goes without saying that if you're growing corn, especially if you're a farmer and you have several, you have many acres that you have planted corn in, you're going to want ears of corn that come, that look like that. I remember a few years ago when we had a real drought. In fact, it was so bad that I was afraid that my bushes in front of my house were going to dry up and be gone. But I went by a farm near my father's house. And there was a cornfield there that just looked, it just, it was just from, from the start of the field to the back of the field, it just didn't get the moisture it needed in order for a corn crop. And I felt bad because I knew this. There wasn't enough corn growing in that field to make it worth the while of the farmer to start up his equipment and all of that fuel that it takes to harvest a crop. It wasn't, in fact, I'll be honest with you, the, the field was in such horrible condition that it probably would have been a disgruntled situation for the farmer to even go out with his equipment and plow it under. Just tragically pathetic. That was, that was a man's annual income that amounted to nothing. Um, that's what we have in this story. Of course, the most pathetic incident in this story is the seed that became bird food. Uh, the others, yes, they they produced life, but not the not the desired effect, not the desired result of which the farmer hoped. Let's read on. Verse 10. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve, they asked him about the illustration. They asked him about the story, about the parable. 
And he said to them, unto you is given the ability to understand the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those on the outside, everything is in parables. That seeing, they may see without perceiving. And hearing, hear but not understand. So that they do not convert and their sins be forgiven. And if this sounds a little awkward to you, let me explain. In fact, the word of God says, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. I have to be honest with you this morning. I don't think that salvation takes place in an individual's heart because of casual observance, because of a casual interest. I, I know that in wondrous mercy and love, many times sinners are saved in spite of themselves. But if you aren't serious about your soul's condition, if there isn't within you a desire for the things of God, and I don't want to get in trouble with a Calvinist here. We're not going to explain what that is. But... I don't think that God just reaches through and snatches somebody and saves them in spite of themselves. There's a need for the nurturing, for the carrying of that seed so that it will have an opportunity not only to sprout, but to nur be nurtured and to grow and produce the desired effect that God has for his investment in the soil of our lives. Let's see what Jesus does as he explains this story. Verse 13, he asked them, don't you understand this parable? Uh, then how could you understand any parables? And I, I'm going to suggest to you this morning that this parable is really, it, it's, it's about as basic as an illustration can be. Uh, we're, we're familiar. I, when we were kids in second, first grade, uh, our teachers would give us, uh, they don't call it this anymore, uh, but they used to have what were called Dixie Cups. Everything's gone styrofoam now, but we would get a little Dixie Cup, and we'd go out and get soil, a little dirt, and we would plant a seed. Our teacher would give us the seed, and we did this a few weeks before Mother's Day. And we would have something growing up in our little cup, in our little Dixie Cup, that we would decorate to take home to mom, okay? And it was always exciting to see it come up. And, and I have to be honest with you, there were, there were kids that couldn't leave their cup alone. <laughs> we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna find out about that, okay? And they had to be messing and picking with it and, and poking their finger at it. Leave it alone. In fact, we're gonna learn from this scripture that things having to do with seeds they grow, and it's interesting that in the Greek, the word is automatically. Huh. Can you imagine that? Anyway, let's, let's move on. He says, don't you understand this parable? Then how will you understand any parable? And he wants to make sure, as he's teaching his disciples, he wants to make sure that they get this. Because if they don't understand a basic parable like this, they're going to have a hard time making an application of truth in the regard of other stories, in the regard of other illustrations, parables. Para goes along with, okay? Parables. He who sows, verse 14, sows the word. The seed, in other words, is the word of God. And these are those along the pathway where the word is sown or planted. And when they hear Satan, who is against the effect of God's word in our heart, he immediately comes and snatches away the word that was sown in their hearts. I, I said before, and I didn't say it would be funny, but where the purpose of that seed was that it might grow and bring forth fruit, it ended up being bird food. And there are people that in the regard of God's word, they look at it rather than seeing it as spiritual truth, rather than seeing it as something that God intends to impact us 
in the depths of our soul and to make a change in our life. There are people that want to look at the Bible from some bizarre intellectual perspective and they say, well, don't you really think that the story of Jonah and the whale is really a philosophical but da ba da ba da and they go on and on with this and, and, and I, I listen to that kind of thing and I go like, no, I, I think that this guy got thrown out of a boat and a whale came along and oh, swallowed him up and then ultimately and finally that story, which is a parable, illustrates Jesus three days and three nights in the heart of the earth after his crucifixion and there was a sign given to us from the story of Jonah and the whale. And it has to do with spiritual things. Come on. Your Bible is a spiritual message. It is instruction. It is teaching from God that you and I might have our lives changed by the impact of such... I mean, this, this is divine truth. This is from God himself. Verse 16. Likewise, those that are sown on stony ground, who upon hearing the word of God at once receive it with joy. And like I said, and it does. It sprouts. There is life in the seed. There, there's nothing wrong with the seed. But it sprouts. Yet, having no root in themselves, they are but temporary. Something comes along when they face trouble or persecution and notice, because of the word, friends might come along and say, ah, you're all in, well, you Bible thumping Jesus freak. And you're going, oh, man, you know, I better kind of, I better kind of tone this down a bit because now he's, I play football with these guys or I, you know, I do this or that with these lady friends, with these gal friends of mine and whatnot, you know, I don't want them to think that I'm some sort of a religious fanatic. And as a result, the Bible goes on the shelf. The prayer life comes to an end. Attendance with the people of God at the church diminishes to the point that it becomes something I heard somebody that was complaining. He says, you know, every time I go to your church, he was talking to a pastor, he says, every time I go to your church, he says, you're always preaching the same thing. He says, I've only heard you, the many times I've been there, give one or two different messages. And the pastor looked at him and he said, you know, if you'd show up for more than Christmas and Easter, you might hear a few different messages. And what happens then with an individual where the seed has actually had an opportunity for growth rather than being nurtured, cared for, rather than being watered and fed, it withers away, the sun comes along and scorches it and it produces no fruit. These are those that are sown into the thorn bushes. Young people get a hold of this. But the anxieties of this age, we mentioned that in our prayer this morning, the deceitfulness of wealth and their passion for other things encumbers them. It squeezes into their life and squeezes out this most important factor that you will ever have to deal with in all your years. And it chokes the word, causing it to be unfruitful. Wow. And yet, I, I have to tell you, I, I've made the mistake a few times. I like cars, okay? I've made the mistake a few times of buying an extra car just for, you know, for a hobby kind of fun thing, sort of, you know. And I'll tell you what, it just, every time you go out to start that thing, the battery's dead, uh, one of the four tires are flat, uh, there's this, there's that. And by the time you get the thing running so you can take it up and down the road a little bit, you've wasted more time than the crazy thing is worth. I, I have a friend who got a boat. And he said, I, I said, man, it must be nice to have a boat like that. He goes, I'll tell you what. He says, there, there's, he said, there's, there's two 
In the regard of owning a boat, he says the two most important days are the day that you buy it and the day that you sell it. He said, I got to get rid of this thing. It's just eating me up. That's what's happening here. And it has a reason. And it could be something as legitimate as education. It could be something as legitimate as starting a business. It could have to do with all kinds of issues of life that get in to your seedbed where the word of God has been planted and squeeze it out, choke it out. Verse 20, I, I love verse 20. These are those that are sown on good ground who hear the word, they welcome it, and it brings forth fruit 130, 160, and 100 fold. And you can see the difference just in those, those silly ears of corn I passed out. Can you imagine if you had a field full of those nice full ears at the end of harvest, you've got a couple semi trucks full of corn grain. But I'll tell you, if you had those other two pithy looking pieces of, I mean, it's hard to even describe them as corn because there's just, there's no corn there. It's, it, it's like, I mean, you'd be better to just describe it as husks. The husks that the swine did eat, the Bible says. And I'm not sure that those look very appetizing to pig food. But if you had a field full of that, you'd be lucky to get a handful of grain to maybe take home and grind up to make a muffin. I hope you see the difference here in what God desires out of his investment in your life. The seed is the word of God. And he told them, verse 21, and I've got to move along here. A lamp is not brought to be placed under a bushel basket. Not at home, I've got a little bushel basket somewhere. Uh, I'm going to blame Sherry. She probably put it away. I could not find it. <laughs> but anyway, and, and I did have a lamp. But I chose, rather than a lamp, I chose to do this. And you all know what this is because we were handing these out last week. Look right at that. Man, that's bright. If we didn't have these... Yeah, see? If we didn't have these lights on, goodness, that that about blind you, wouldn't it? But if these lights were all turned off and the windows were closed and it was dark in here, you'd love to have one of these. And here's what I'd do. I'd say, well, look, it comes in a really nice box. And here's what you need. Because it's dark in here, turn that light on. And uh, yeah, you'll find this to be very, very, whoops, I got the lid on upside down. You'll find this to be very, very helpful. And I hand this to you and say, there, now you don't have to worry about the darkness. And you say, wait a minute. You're out of your mind. And you don't turn. Look at it, it's bright. You, you don't take a light and put it in a box. You don't take a lamp and hide it underneath a bushel basket. I better turn this off or I'm going to have a dead battery. What, what does it say here? Isn't it brought to be put upon a lampstand? Another portion of scripture says that it might give light to all those in the house. For nothing is hid which shall not be exposed, nor brought to be concealed, but that it come to light. If you've got ears to hear, listen up. In other words, in our lives, there are those things having to do with life and light that have a spiritual purpose for which God would impact us in the regard of everything from our planning to our ultimate successes as we live here on this earth. I suppose that you and I could think of individuals that uh, at the end of their life, we, we'd say something like this. They didn't have anything to show for it. Uh, even in the regard of material things, even in the regard of the practical stuff of living. But how about what God is looking for? How about the importance for which Christ came into the world? 
the, the very factor of Jesus going through his very short life only to end up on a cross where he, the Bible says, he poured out, he poured out his soul unto death. If you don't understand how important you are to the person of Jesus Christ, you've missed the most important thing regarding life. Because anything else that you might work for, anything else that you might achieve, doesn't hold a candle to what God is trying to accomplish by shining his light into your life. And he told them, Watch what you hear. I, I, I read this and I thought of another thing where Jesus said, watch and pray. That means to focus. Focus on what you hear. By what measure you use to measure, it will be measured unto you. And unto you that hear, more will be added. For whoever has, he will receive. And the person who does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. So I brought some measuring devices this morning. First of all, here's a measuring scoop. It doesn't say on here, but I'll tell you what, if I was at the candy store, I'd want a bigger scoop than this. We used to go to, there used to be these, if you, I mean, this is, this is proof of inflation. We used to have what was called the five and dime. And, and eventually we called, we called them the 10 cent store. Now we've got dollar stores, and everything at the dollar store is a dollar and a quarter. Okay, let's get off that subject. But I remember they had, they had bulk candy, and I loved it when this one little lady was behind the counter because she'd reach in there with that scoop. And I would say, I want so much of, you know, jelly beans or whatever. And she would take her scoop and she'd get those jelly beans and put them on the little scale. And then she'd scoop again and she'd kind of take it, take it, take it while I'm talking to her. And it'd go way over, you know, and she'd put them in a bag for me. I just, oh, I loved her. And then there was this grouchy old man, and you know what he did? He took a scoop, put it on the scale, and then he... He started to take off and take off and take off and put them back in there and then put my candy or peanuts or whatever in my bag. And I thought, you tight wad. Yeah, I, I, I was born and raised in a Scottish home, okay? But anyway, with what measure you measure, it will be met up to you. And we'll, we'll get it. By the way, this is really kind of interesting. I, I, I hope Sherry's not making anything today because I've got her cups. And this is one cup, this is a half cup, uh, this is a quarter cup, a third cup, and this is a quarter cup. And, and then I found these. Oh, here, this is a tablespoon, this is a teaspoon, this is a quarter of a teaspoon. And then, have you ever heard of a smidgen? <laughs> that, that's the way Grandma talked. Well, you know, this, this needs a smidgen of, of salt, or it needs a smidgen of baking soda. Well, this is a smidgen. <laughs> this, this is a pinch. Just a pinch. And then uh, this bigger one here is a dash. Yeah, uh, after you get done with making those brownies, uh, Sprinkle a dash of powdered sugar on them. Okay? That's that's this one here. <laughs> Boy, there's a there's a measurement for, for virtually anything. And yet it's used here to illustrate from the standpoint that has to do with what you involve yourself in in life and what you will amount to, especially as a believer. And if you don't pour yourself into your Christian life, into your Christian walk, you know what's going to be poured out on you when it comes to the blessings of God according to that which you have given. I could give you scriptures for that. But let's move on. Because we got a long ways to go and I'm out of time already. And he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should toss a seed upon the ground 
And he, he, he leaves it alone. He doesn't poke at it and tinker with it, try to help it out of the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and matures. He doesn't know how. He, do, he doesn't have a degree like my dad did. My dad had a degree in horticulture. Here's a guy that just knows, he just knows what you do with the seed. You put it in the ground, and you leave it alone, and you go to bed, and you wake up, and you go to bed, you, okay. Verse 28 says, for the earth produces fruit automatically. Put the seed, you, you know to put the seed in the ground, put the seed in the ground, leave it alone, and when it's going to sprout, first foliage, then a head, then mature grain in the head, but when the fruit ripens, this, this farmer who doesn't have a degree in horticulture, he knows what to do. He knows to go and get his sickle because the grain is ready to be harvested. When the fruit ripens, immediately he gets out the sickle because the harvest is ready. You know, you don't have to be a theologian with, with a PhD in theology or a master's of divinity in order to read these things and be able to figure out what's involved in the Christian life. Can I say it like this? Any dummy can do it. Just do what you know is to be done. When you're dealing with seed, make sure that seed is planted, that it's nurtured, that it's cared for, and when it comes time for the harvest, take a look at what it has produced and harvest that seed and use it for eternal benefit. Verse 30, and he said, what may we compare the kingdom of God or to what parable may we illustrate it? The word there is actually parabolize it. It's like a grain of mustard seed. And by the way, if you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's just tiny. And, and I know the Bible says it's the smallest of all the seeds and people want to argue that because they say, well, what about, what about a spore in a mushroom? Oh, come on. I, I, Mushrooms are good for eating, okay? And a spore causes a mushroom. But the idea here of a mustard seed is how worthless it is. Because quite frankly, mustard is a weed. And in my dad's field, mustard would grow. You can go by farmer's fields, and if they look like they're just covered with yellow, it's likely mustard. And it starts up with this little worthless seed. And it grows, and it grows... I remember we had bean bushes, soybean bushes that were a good three foot off the, off the ground, and we had mustard plants that were four and a half, five foot off the ground, and you know what we would find underneath them? We'd find these little birds called killdeer, and they say, killdeer, 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 and they would, they would deposit their eggs underneath that the, the shade from that mustard seed that had grown into quite, I'm telling you, I've seen mustard plants that were that big around at the base. We had to cut them off with a hoe. My dad said, go out and enjoy using this hoe. And he'd sharpen it for me. And he says, ho, ho, ho. I didn't think it was very funny. But I'll tell you what, I got rid of the mustard plants. And sometimes we'd see those little baby birds and we'd say, Dad, can't we just leave this one here because there's baby birds there? I don't even want to tell you what my dad said. But anyway, um, those, you know, someone might look at a mustard and seed, a mustard seed and say, what a worthless little seed. Tell that to a killed deer. They build a house underneath that mustard plant. And... That's another illustration of the kingdom of God. Something that might seem unimportant to you is of the utmost importance to someone else. So you be careful how you treat the issue, not just of your own values, but the values of other people, because you might blow something off as not being worth the crack of your finger, when in reality, another person is depending on it. And with many other parables, he spoke the word to them so long as they were able to listen, but he did not speak to them 
without using parables. However, later, he explained it to his disciples. The rest of the chapter has to do with the story of Jesus being in the boat with his disciples and the big storm comes and the, the waves and the wind. It, it, it says, fill the boat. Now, I don't know if you know what happens when a boat's full of water, but I do. Unless if Jesus is asleep in the back. And there's Jesus sleeping with his head on a pillow. Probably a pillow soaked with water. I, but anyway, and they wake him up and they say, Master, we're going to perish. I want you to know that if Jesus is in your boat, you ain't going down. Okay? And this is kind of a neat thing. We'll discuss it at another time. But he said to them, and this word is used in three different places in the scripture, five times in total. But the word has to do with cowardly, cowardice, and cowards. And here's Jesus with his disciples in the boat. And it's a little hard for me to handle here, but he said to them, why are you such cowards? Can we close with this thought? That if you have Jesus Christ in your life, you can have full confidence even when everyone else is convinced that the ship is going down, that all is well. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, he'll never know, never desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, he'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for everything that this little chapter holds. Might it speak to our hearts today. Might we have confidence in this concept, in this principled life called the kingdom of God and realize that even things that we don't understand, situations we see in other people's lives that we might even poke fun at, and yet they find solace, peace. They find in those things that you're doing in their lives they find the satisfaction that only you can give. Help us to learn to respect one another in our walk with the Lord and realize that you've called us to walk different paths. But for those of us who believe on your name, those paths lead to home. I pray that if there's someone here today who has not allowed the good seed of the word of God to enter into their fertile soil and to sprout and take root that today they would hear the word of God speaking to them and receive it with joy and bear forth fruit 30, 60 let's go for a hundred times as much we bless your name we thank you for the opportunity that you make in our lives that something might return to you for eternal glory. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.